1. Fans love rewriting history, but the way they handled Kim Garam's situation is next level. Now, all of a sudden, they're pretending they weren't the very ones throwing gasoline on that fire? It's straight-up revisionist garbage, the whole hype forced her out narrative is a convenient lie to cover up how vicious fans were, they practically bullied the company into giving in after months of relentless hate, it wasn't Hybe's fault. They held on as long as they could, but the pressure was nuclear, those rumors about Garam were some of the nastiest most unfounded trash I've ever seen, people were jumping on absurd conspiracy theories, including insane claims about her being involved, with higher-ups, all with zero evidence, but did that stop the mob? Absolutely not, they ran with it like it was the gospel, sure, it's fine to take a victim's side initially, but the 180 degree turn now is laughable, own it, you didn't know the facts. You hated her and now you're scrambling to justify your nastiness? And the fans acting like Hybe just stood around doing nothing? Come on, Hybe got trashed non-stop for standing by Garam, yet now these same hypocrites are whining that they let her go too soon, pick a side and stick to it, this girl was barely out of the gate before people came at her with pitchforks, and now suddenly, everyone's curious if she'll make a comeback? Unbelievable, Garam went through a lot and she's better off far away from this toxic cesspool, Hybe and Source Music did what they could but the fan hate was relentless, and now the group is still dealing with the fallout, which isn't even their fault. It's all on the so-called fans who whipped this into a frenzy in the first place, the hypocrisy is off the charts, the same fans who were ready to see her kicked out are now blaming Hybe for caving in, make it make sense, everyone loves blaming the company because it's the easiest target, sure, Hybe deserves heat when they screw up, but this Garam mess? The fans drove the narrative, stoked the fires and then washed their hands of it once it went too far, it's pathetic, I followed this case closely, Garam wasn't some monster, she was sticking up for a friend, and Hybe even laid it out plainly, but no, people ignored that and kept twisting it to fit their toxic narrative, fans act like they care about idols, but they're the first ones to drag them through the mud at the smallest rumor, it's disgusting, Hybe couldn't win here, defend her, get crucified, let her go, still crucified, every statement they made was dismissed as PR spin, even though they were trying to defuse the situation, and fans, who claim companies should protect their idols were the ones fanning the flames that made it impossible for Hybe to do just that. What a joke. 2. Red Velvet's Joy might be leaving SM Entertainment. Joy has been in talks with an acting agency, leading to reports speculating that she's preparing to ditch SM once her contract wraps up. But SM is claiming they're still in negotiations for a contract renewal. Honestly, if Joy leaves SM, no one should be surprised. She's been dropping hints for over a year and a half about her frustration with how SM manages her career. Especially when it comes to Red Velvet, she's been doing more than her fair share of the work for the group, and her solo career has been stifled under SM's control. A different label could actually give her the opportunity she's been missing out on. SM's whole we're still discussing line? It's classic SM. They only officially cut ties when it's clear there's no saving the deal. This we're negotiating game was the same with Irene. Leaking these rumors might even be part of SM's playbook to pressure the artists during contract talks. Wouldn't be the first time SM tried to sway public perception to keep their idols in check, and for Red Velvet, Joy leaving isn't going to collapse the group, sure, some fans think it might hurt their comeback schedule, but let's be honest here, Red Velvet has been coasting on one comeback a year for a while now, they're a decade in, expecting them to pump out content like a factory at this stage is just unrealistic. Groups like TWICE, BTS and Seventeen are the exception, not the standard. If Joy wants to focus on solo work, let her. If the rest of the group sticks with SM, that's their call. They're grown adults who should be able to do whatever works for their careers. Red Velvet isn't going to crumble because one or two members take a different path. Fans need to adjust their expectations. 3. Lisa surprised me with how much music she's putting out. She's dropping a new single in less than two months after New Woman, and honestly, it's about time she shook off the YG chains and showed what she's really capable of. YG's notorious for stifling its artists under the guise of strategic partnerships, basically making more off your face than your music, and Blackpink's been their cash cow for years, cranking out just enough music to keep the fans hooked while leaning heavily on luxury brand deals, so Lisa finally stepping out and flooding us with new music? It's like a giant middle finger to the idea that Blackpink never cared about making music, New Woman was the kind of track YG would never have let happen. They were too busy pumping out formulaic hits that guaranteed success but offered zero risk. Lisa's proving that maybe she wasn't sitting around content with just the endorsement deals, maybe she was just stuck in a label that cared more about Channel and Dior than music, now she's pushing boundaries, trying new things, and you can see the hunger in her work, and while Lisa's out here grinding, what's Rosie doing? Sure, she joined the black label, but instead of taking the creative leap we expected, 
she's playing it safe, maybe she's more interested in stability and mental peace than reinventing herself musically, which is fair, but it's disappointing given how much people hyped her as the artist of the group, Jenny's always had one foot in both music and fashion, so it's no shock that she's keeping things balanced, and Jisoo's focus on acting was the most obvious move ever, but she's actually doing well with it, in the end, Lisa's the one proving she's not just the dancer or the rapper, she's showing there's a lot more depth there, and she's got the guts to do what YG held her back from. 4. The 50-50 boycott will never work, these half-assed boycotts are a joke, if you think skipping a couple of streams is going to put any dent in a multi-million dollar company's revenue, you're delusional. Companies like Attract have already funneled millions into their current lineup and they're not going to be swayed by a few less Spotify plays. Their bottom line is shielded by investments in corporate backing far beyond anything a half-hearted boycott could ever touch. Plus, the new members are completely innocent in this whole dumpster fire, yet they're catching the brunt of the so-called outrage. Meanwhile, the former members, who clearly had their own agenda are being painted as victims of the century, despite the fact they were negotiating with Warner Music behind the scenes to break their contracts. But no, go ahead and direct your hate at the new recruits who had zero say in this mess. What's even more pathetic is the selective outrage. People are out here crying, foul over the way the former members were treated, but somehow miss the irony of their own actions, they're hate-streaming the new group, plastering TikTok with endless rants and think they're somehow sticking it to the company. Newsflash, every view, every comment, every click just boosts the new group's visibility. You can't claim to be boycotting when you're actively driving engagement, that's just clown behavior. Most of these boycotters aren't even mad about the situation, they just want something to rage about. They're turning this into some twisted sport, aiming their vitriol at the wrong people while propping up half-baked theories from Twitter threads. If you're going to talk about boycotting, at least educate yourself with real verifiable information. Throwing out baseless claims and pretending like you're some kind of moral warrior is embarrassing. 5. SM Entertainment is debuting a trot boy group. There are five members, the oldest is 32 and the youngest is 26. If you're unfamiliar with the trot genre, it can be considered the Korean equivalent of country music. While it's traditionally been tagged as something for older generations, just like country has evolved, trots catching up too, and seeing younger artists jump into the genre is a fresh change, but the seasoned performers, especially those with more years under their belt, are the ones who truly bring the depth that trot thrives on, which's why SM chose members in their late 20s to early 30s for this project. There's just something about having older more experienced artists in the mix that gives the genre that raw emotional punch. These are people who've lived, who've felt deep, complex emotions and when they sing about pain or longing, you can feel it. A teenager might nail the technical aspects of a song, but are they really going to capture its essence? No, that's the beauty of trot. Life experience isn't just a bonus, it's essential. 6. It's He's Not Shy stands out as one of my top picks among their comebacks. It's one of those tracks that might feel a little too loud and chaotic at first, but give it a few spins, and it'll get stuck in your head, especially Cherry Young's It's he line in the chorus. Years have passed and I'm still obsessed with it, What's great about this track is that it feels so them, it's got that signature it's the energy, the in-your-face confidence we first saw when they debuted, Leah's vocals in the opening were perfect, she brings this smoothness that sets the tone just right. Before the rest of the song charges in with a mix of fierce rap and sweet vocals, it's that balance of attitude rapping and bright melody that makes it so addictive, the chorus might hit you as over the top at first with all that brass and boldness. But that's the charm of it, it's made to be big, loud, and memorable. And let's not forget the visuals, the MV is classic K-pop flashiness, and the styling is top tier, Ryunjin's cowboy hat and silver hair. Iconic, Cheryoung absolutely owns her center time, her presence was hard to beat, overall, not shy is quintessential itzy, unapologetic, energetic, and full of personality. 7. Let's review Yuchi's new single Radio Dum Dum, Yuchi's solo debut Bonnie and Clyde hit like a freight train, there's no denying its bold impact. It had drama, rock energy, and attitude for days, but sadly, her first comeback freak didn't continue that momentum. The track was trying to be the bad boy of K-pop but ends up sitting at the kids' table, but special single Radio Dum Dum is a different beast altogether. And it's not trying to hit you over the head with anything groundbreaking, it's more laid back but Yuchi's voice really thrives in this setting, riding that smooth guitar and percussion effortlessly. It also got that mid-2000s radio pop feel, you can almost feel the nostalgia creeping in, but it's balanced enough to still feel current. Will Radio Dum Dum be the song people talk about at the end of the year? Nope, but does it serve its purpose? Absolutely.